Hey, pull up a chair. We're so glad to have you join us here on the Back Porch Education Podcast. For the next half hour or so, we're going to talk about all things educational. It's a wonderful day to learn something. Glad you could join us. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Back Porch Education Podcast. I'm Jason here with Steve. And I'm also here with Robinson Jeffers once again. <laughs> so last time was Shine Republic in honor of Plato. Today we're doing Shine Perishing Republic. While this America settles in the mold of its vulgarity, heavily thickening to empire and protest, only a bubble in the molten mass pops and sighs out and the mass hardens, I sadly smiling remember that the flower fades to make fruit, the fruit rots to make earth. Out of the mother and through the spring exultances, ripeness and decadence, and home to the mother. You making haste, haste on decay. Not blameworthy, life is good, be it stubbornly long or suddenly a mortal splendor. Meteors are not needed less than mountains. Shine, perishing republic. But for my children, I would have them keep their distance from the thickening center. Corruption never has been compulsory. When the cities lie at the monster's feet, there are left the mountains. And boys, be in nothing so moderate as in the love of man. A clever servant, insufferable master. There is the trap that catches noblest spirits that caught they say, God, when he walked on earth. Wow. So (laughs) it's, uh, it's a lot there. I like the movement. I like the, um, the, the kind of countercultural notion that it's where it's happening, that center, that thickening center as inviting as that sounds and looks the real stuff's happening on the edges, man. Uh, yes, it's a great, it's a great call to the young of today who can so quickly get distracted by the siren call of, of what's cool that, um, Mm -hmm. uh, cool is not always cool. Right. Well, yeah, it's in vogue, but it's not, not helpful. It's going to disappear. That's, that's, that's where he starts. And that's a great place to, yep. You'd almost think that would be his ending, but that's where he starts. Is this is all going to mm-hmm. go away? So be careful with it. Well, some things that don't go away is the great conversation we've been having uh, for several weeks now about Plato and his Republic, and in particular the uh, great analogies that he gave us uh, to to use uh, teachers in education. Uh, you know, in, in some regards, I could argue that the word education itself to lead or to lead out mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. is based upon Plato's notion that, that that's what a true teacher is supposed to be doing is going somewhere with his students um, and uh, bringing them in, in today's discussion out of the cave. So uh, I, I think at the beginning, because we don't want to spend a lot of time rehashing what he already put in better words than we probably could. Um, <laughs> We want to invite the listener, if you're not familiar in particular with the with the most complex of the three, and if you thought the divided line took a little bit of, if you found yourself grabbing a pencil and paper and dividing lines out w- with us <laughs> when we were talking about it, this is even more complex. So this is a whole picture. We've provided you with a uh, illustration of Plato's Cave uh, in the website page for, for this particular episode. Um, I've also placed a link there for you if you want to go read this specific portion of uh, the, uh, the the cave analogy from the Republic. Uh, familiarize yourself with it. It's not that long and it's not that difficult. No. Uh, but if you have the, pi- the picture in your mind, uh, we think some of the derived ideas that we're talking about today uh, will make more sense to you than if, if, if it's not fresh in your mind. Uh, go refresh yourself first. It's the beauty of a podcast. It's got a pause button whenever you need to use it. That's right. 
Yeah. It's right next to the PayPal donation button. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. Nice. That was uh, very incognito. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah. So, Well, you and I spent a lot of time with, with, with Plato. We both get a lot from him. And, and I know you're kind of itching today. You've got some things. i got some things. Why don't I give you first shot? Where, okay. Where do you want to start us? Yeah, man, I appreciate that. Let me... Um, let let me do these two things. First, I want to talk about where the cave is situated in the Republic. We're talking about forming a just society, how it would be structured. It takes hundreds of pages. But in that, we have the cave. It comes right after the other two analogies of the sun and the divided line. Immediately after the cave, though, Socrates and Glaucon jump right into discussing curriculum. Yep. Okay. So I think that's important. I don't know exactly how yet. I don't know what I'm going to do with that. But if I don't do something with that by the end of the episode, Steve, you do it or someone else needs to pick it up and run with it because that's that's big. So that's, that's the first thing. Yeah. So uh, if I can. Yeah, go ahead. So. I like this. I like talking about the position of in just the right uh, set of in, in a, in a perfect outline, Plato has brought up the notion, what, who is best suited to lead this just society? Mm-hmm. What's well, got to be this philosopher King. Exactly. Well, well, how do you make that guy? Yep. And that's where the analogies come in. He's got to be someone that can find and handle and teach the truth. Mm -hmm. A just society can't happen outside the truth. That's right. And, and, and we, we face this today in so many ways is incredibly helpful. Uh, So before you jump into what to teach them, let me give you some analogies for how that teaching works. Right. How and, the soul moves as a result yeah, of proper education. Exactly. How how this, this incredibly powerful eye of the soul sees things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's good. That's a great point you're making. I, I think that there's a I don't I don't find Plato making too many missteps uh in in his planning of his dialogues. He normally gives you what you need for yeah. the next idea to come. So Right, they're pretty tight. Let me uh, let me also say, Steve, that I am proud of us because we, you know that we both l- tend toward uh, agricultural metaphors like grow, nurture, cultivate. But when we talked about the soul just then, I said move, how the soul moves, and you said how the soul sees. And those are both metaphors that Plato right. uses. So yeah. we're killing we it. This is this is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> the other the other thing that I want to say, sort of as an opening overture, or uh, as a as an entry point into the cave. Oh, okay, no pun intended. Sorry, everybody. Um, is I, I want to dis, uh, sort of describe how I'm how I was wrong in what I thought the cave was before I read it in preparation for this episode. Okay. So if you would have told me, uh, or if you would have asked me to tell you the metaphor of the cave, then before I reread it this last time, I would have told you that everyone's chained up. And then all of a sudden this one amazing guy finds some way to bust loose and triumphantly, you know, uh, gets out of the, um, chains and marches up the cave entrance and heroically steps into the sun. And when he sees the sun or, or when he sees the light, he is overwhelmed by that and he has some difficulty with it, but that is not what happens. Okay. Instead you get a lot of language like passive voice, right? So, uh, Socrates says, well, suppose there were people uh, who were chained up and suppose one of them was liberated 
don't you think that when he stands up, he's going to be in pain from being chained down all that time? And don't you think he's going to uh, not want to leave? And don't you think it's going to be difficult? And then suppose that he's dragged up the cave entrance, right? There's a lot of pain. There's a, he's a subject. He is not the, or let's see, what is it? He's the object, right? Not the subject. He's not the actor. He's being acted up on. Yep. And it's, and it's almost purgatorial. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, I don't mean like in a, in a ca- strictly Catholic sense. I just mean he's, it's pain and work. And uh, it doesn't seem like the sort of thing that he's very responsible for, this person who's being freed. Yeah, and, and I think that it I, – I probably made the similar mistake uh, that you're talking about in that I thought the whole world's chained up and who's, who's the cool dude that – you know, is it Jesus or Buddha or somebody that, that, that busted out? Uh, but his mm-hmm. analogy is, is that, that there are already people out there. Right. And I don't think he's talking so much about the, as you put it, heroic nature of man to lead other men, but he's talking about what you're, what you're describing, the agony mm. that anyone goes through in trying to find truth. Yeah. That it's not something you stumble on, um, though there may be stumbling involved. Um, if you're going to seek out the truth, there's got to be uh, some, some, some pain and some uh, change, some alteration in, in the positioning of your soul's eye. Uh, it's got to stop staring at the wall. It's got to find itself free of the change. It's got to get out into the light and so on. It's, it's not going to be just a, one day I woke up and knew all truth. Um, you know, there's a progression, I guess is probably the best way to put this, which is important to the notion of education that things just, you, there's not a snap of the fingers. This is not a, never confused with a sprint. Any teacher will tell you it's a long marathon that needs a lot of water breaks, mm-hmm. more, more potty breaks than you're given. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey, during this brief break, I wanted to encourage you to use the share buttons we have on our website in order to help us get folks tuned into the show. Our goal is to encourage as many educators, homeschoolers, NFL punters, and donut makers as we can with these podcasts. So help us get the word out. Share our Facebook page. Send folks a link to one of your favorite episodes. Do whatever you can to help us share this craziness with either your best friends or, if it's more appropriate, your worst enemies. We will love you all the more for sharing our love. Thanks. And now, back to the show. Okay, so coming back from the water break, I think that you're right, Steve, that the pain um, or the discomfort that comes with seeking truth is inherent in sort of the process of education. But I also think it speaks volumes against me, honestly, that I glossed that in my, in my own understanding of the cave, right? That I didn't remember that part of the cave, that I just remember the sort of mountaintop experience or the staring at the truth experience I try and make myself feel a little bit better and say that that's somewhat common um, for teachers, uh, that it's easy for us to uh, forget the tears and the pain that come with learning, even though we're in it all the time, right? Um, a little bit of humility goes a long way there. Right. And, and, and I think in particular for a teacher who's a, accomplished in any way, has got any kind of experience with the constant reminder that the, the, the reason to rehearse this stuff to ourselves is uh, we forget mm-hmm. about all of that for the glory of what's been obtained. Once, once we have the truth, it's just sort of like you talking to a mother about all the agony of childbirth. But it, yeah, but she's not focused on that. She's focused on what happened right after that when somebody put the child in her arms. Right. And so there's a little bit of sort of forgetfulness <laughs> about just how bad it was, you know. Thank goodness, um, right? Right. And, and, and 
it's not lost on me that 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 Greek term agony is not just a negative term. It's applied to to in particular uh, he uh, Paul applies it to the to the Olympic Games. You know that 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 you agonize your body in order to make it ready for performance. And so, dude, I had uh, no idea. Really. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, agonistomai, I think, is the we we get the word agony from this Greek term that meant um, uh, a severe training of the body. Hmm. And and I'm worried about the movement towards making. Well, there's two things. One, I think you covered already with your, your how quickly we want to jump over this to the curriculum. Mm-hmm, that it's mm-hmm. it's the material that's important. If if this stuff isn't there, if the if the proper pedagogy is not commensurate with the curriculum, uh, all the reading in the world, or all the great printed materials, or the new eBooks, or what, it, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't work without the right methodology involved with it. But there's also the movement to try and make the curriculum and the pedagogy and everything fun. You know, I've got that ad right. popping up on my computer from time to time that wants to make my classroom like Minecraft. And I'm like, no, I don't. Please, no. Oh, <laughs> no, thank you. I really, <laughs> I think our <laughs> students have plenty of Minecraft. The last thing I want to do is is go running down that road with my classroom. And I think a lot of it is born in this desire. We want to make it as mm-hmm. easy as possible. And that's really not going to, in the end, produce the results we were hoping for. Right. And that, yeah, so that's that's it, right? The We do want to make it easy as possible. That I, I think that's good. Like, I think that's a noble thing. You know, you don't want to make something hard just for its own sake. But we, we also want it to be lasting. And um, I'll return to the analogy that Poe offers of it's the slow uh, imprint of the seal that lets the wax take the, the seal or the mold or whatever, you know, so. Right, right, right. And and again, I'm not, I don't think it should be difficult just for difficulty's sake. Right. No, I but I think that if it's going to be of any worth, it's, it, Plato is certainly implying that some agony is going to be involved. That's right. At each step, right? Okay, so right. he takes the chains off. Ow, my wrists are. He um, stood up, right? They someone picks him up. Ow, my right. back hurts. I was sitting down for a long time. He's drug up the entryway. Hey, my eyes yep. hurt. You know, actually, there's even pain when he turns around, when he gets his first look at. Even though it's very filtered light, it's not the cave wall, which is what he's used to looking at. And so there's pain even in, in that. Uh, but so, so get this, though. This, this is a, another thing I, I wanted to um, really bring out. Another part of the analogy I completely forgot about was after he gets out, right? Then he goes back in the cave. Okay, we all know that. But it was the reaction. I, I misjudged or I misremembered that the reaction of those in the cave their reaction is not to kill him, not first. Their first reaction is to laugh at him. Right, like right? he's deranged. Right, because why? Because he can't see. Yeah. Because his eyes have adjusted to the sun, that is, because his soul has adjusted to the truth. When he's plunged into darkness, he can't argue well. He can't reason well. He can't see well. And so they laugh at him. And it's only then that Plato says, if anyone else tried to uh, release somebody, they would be killed because they don't want, uh, because the people in the cave don't want to be made into an idiot like this guy. Well, I think it's the whole ball of wax. They saw his pains getting out of the cave. Right. And they see what getting out of the cave's done to him once he returns. Why would I want to be like that guy? <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. right. Leave me alone. What a good question. <laughs> Leave the abscess tooth alone in my mouth. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, and but but 
it, that's a that's a real qu- like so sort of sitting out of the analogy we of course look at the the people in the cave and have pity on them but if being in the cave is all i knew then yes that like it is a legitimate question why would i want to be made like him he can't see now and he was hurting a lot well and this is a big deal to me because how you answer that their question okay uh, mm-hmm. really forms the appetite of that student. If you say to them, well, you need to be like me so you can make a good living or give them practical reasons how this is going to help them, Mm -hmm. they may feel like, well, they they may think they're a way to the same practical outcome without all the pain. Yeah. But if, if you're able to and I think it almost has to be illustrated rather than just told, if you're able to show them that this is what real freedom is, that your chains are really not freedom. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that's at the heart of Plato's point. Yeah. You you feel like this is normal life to be chained up like this. It's not. And if you have any... You know, if if you can get the appetite to be free, then you'll go through all the difficulty I've gone through to be such. Um, I think we try and con kids too much. I think we try and tell them how geometry is going to help them figure the circumference of their fire pit out back when they go to build it or <laughs> something like that. Right. And 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 not really get involved in showing them that it's all a part of understanding a world that we live in and that we want to live in well and that we want to be happy in and that happiness is directly related to the heart set free to see the world as it really is, not as it's pretending to be, but (laughs) it reminds me of like that, that sort of thing leads to like the memes that you'll see, which this one's hilarious, dude. I don't care. Uh, Like you'll see every, you know, March or April where, it says, uh, like somebody will say something like, um, oh gosh, what is it? Man, I sure am glad I went to school. That class is really coming in handy this algebra season. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Or this geometry season or whatever. Well, we pick on math in particular because, you know, it's math. And, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and if you're a practically minded person, I've got to be adding or subtracting or algebra sizing something i've got to be right. it's got to be a one-to-one correlation in their mind and it's and it's not it's it's the soul formed by these truths not the tacit abilities stolen from the art if you if you follow what mm-hmm. i'm saying because mm-hmm. i don't you could take art class all day long and and very few people are going to turn that into a nickel most of them are going to turn it into to pure enjoyment Right. And that's the point. <laughs> it's the, yeah, exactly. It's not bringing everything to a monetized position in life as important as it is to make a decent living. I think uh, as you go about enjoying life, you figure out how to how to get the 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 good life thrown in there, uh, including a few bucks to to feed yourself and mm. clothe your family and that sort of thing. Good. Well, we're kind of we're kind of diving into a, a conversation of um, what the end of education is, right? Like uh, or maybe not the end, but what the the emphasis is on with process or the process of education, the curriculum, the product, uh, what the product is. Maybe we can uh, explore some of those questions after we're back from the break. While this show is a back porch discussion, it does cost a little bit of money. So if you're liking what you hear, consider helping us out. You can simply use the donation button on the website to send along a one-time gift Or we have subscriber plans for those who want to commit to regular support. Subscribers can get premium rewards depending on how nice a chair you pull up on the porch. We have everywhere from sitting on the floor to our finest rocking chair available. But whatever you can do, know that it helps us keep the conversation going. And for that, we heartily thank you. Okay, Steve. So coming back from the break, I have said what I wanted to say in regards to the cave, but tell me what, uh, tell me what you're thinking about when you, when you think about the cave. 
Well, you've emphasized sort of the pain, and I want to talk just a little bit about the joy. Um, <laughs> okay, good, good. The there's no doubt, uh, and and I I guess I kind of go into sports because it's a it's a an analogy I understand well. I've I've done a lot of sports over the years. Uh, when I was younger as a participant and, and now older as a coach, um, you want the euphoric enjoyment of truth. There is a there is something about the truth that just fits, right? It it brings mm-hmm. the proper properly used term here is joy, insight, delight. Um, harmony to your life mm-hmm. for a moment anyway. And it's, it sometimes gets all messed up again. Right. But, but, <laughs> but for the moment, the, the puzzle is coming together and I'm seeing things. I, I mean, this, I believe this is part and parcel of the whole cave analogy is as he's out there, the sun is in, in very bright ways revealing to him how it all really works. And it's like, okay. Now and and that that delight is something that we're seeking, but but the pain that you've been talking about is the precursor to that. So mm-hmm. my soccer players, for instance, don't want to run a mile at the beginning of every soccer practice. They want to go play soccer. Well, I, I want you to go play soccer too. I really want to work on our skills and I want to work on our teamwork and whatnot. But it does me no good to work on any of that if. You know, a fourth of the way through the game, you're all lying on the field because you can't right, you're run. You know, so let's yeah. work on that too. It isn't fun. It isn't the bright and glorious moments of aha. It's all the difficulty getting there. So, yeah. uh, uh, to 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 illustrate this and what this looks like in my classroom, uh, probably the hardest thing I get seniors to do in my seminar class is what well, they think it's very difficult to read something like Plato or Augustine or Aquinas or whatnot. And it is difficult to read those things, but the hardest thing they do is form their own thesis paper because the, the sort of gripey old Mr. Elliot isn't satisfied with their initial half-hearted efforts Right. Um, they find me pushing them and pushing them. I assign each of them a faculty member who, who acts as their sounding board. And that advisor, when they're doing their, their best is pushing them and pushing them, asking them more questions. Got a young lady right now uh, who, who really knows what, what her side says, but she doesn't have much interest in going and finding out what the other viewpoints are. And Mm -hmm. As I promised her from the beginning, I'm not letting you off the hook. This paper, eventually, willingly or unwillingly, you're going <laughs> to reveal all the sides to this issue, or you're not really yet ready to say your side of the issue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and so I, I just value that. Um, I think it's a great reason for my seniors early on in the seminar, and we do it chronologically, so Plato's towards the beginning, but but these are important analogies to them because they recognize, okay, there is the, the the really good stuff, the stuff that still has Mr. Elliot, you know, stretching himself is going to stretch us. And we're not going to feel real comfortable. We're not going to be thrilled about having someone trying to get the chains off and get us out of here. We're, We're, there's a lot of happiness, falsely called happiness, that can mm-hmm. be found bliss that can come from our ignorance. Sure. But I want to, I want to be able to think for myself. And so I've got to, I got to work at that. Yeah. 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 So let, so let me um, hop in there because you ended with a kind of a sports metaphor and I want to uh, use a religious uh, metaphor or character kind of getting after that same thing. The last thing that that struck me about this rating of the cave was when um, Socrates says to Glaucon, when somebody sees somebody else whose vision is perplexed and weak, if he, okay, now I'm not saying exactly what Plato said, but if he is ignorant, then he'll laugh right away. 
right? When he sees someone who can't see, he'll laugh right away. But someone who is wise won't laugh right away for this reason. He will first ask whether the, that soul of the man has come out of the brighter life and is back into the unaccustomed dark, or he has turned from the darkness to the day and is dazzled by the excess of light. So I think that's really awesome. You know, there's, um, there's two ways that the vision can be impaired or, or the soul, continuing it on, can be um, impaired, right? Either after having experienced greater truth and now coming back into uh, the murky waters or beholding truth for the first time yep. or, or to a greater degree. And I think that um, it's really important that we not uh, be so prideful as to think that we're standing in the greatest light that anyone has ever stood in before. Right. Right. So when someone comes to you and they're talking and, and you're not quite making sense of it and they seem to be stumbling all over themselves, it may be that they just don't know as much as you. But it could also be that they are struggling to communicate to you greater truth than you have seen. Yep. yep, yep. And the the uh, the analogy or the, the character that comes to mind uh, for me in, in that is the holy fool that is so um, popular in Russian literature, right? right? This, this, he seems like a fool, but it's because he's experienced something so great that now these categories that you have imposed on the world don't make any sense to him anymore. Yeah, it's, it's the sort of age-old question, who's blowing whose mind? Right, right. Right. You know, it could right. be that I'm about to explode your mind by by having seen some truth you're not at yet. And that's my mm -hmm. general that's so this is the danger of teaching is the assumption is and and with discrete information, okay, like when I'm in a biology classroom, rarely do I have a student just just because of years of reading, rare, rarely do they know more than I do about X, Y, or Z biologically. Sure. I have more knowledge than they do. But but the seminar class is dangerous because I might walk in, <laughs> and, and as Jesus said, out of the mouth of babes, this truth that has escaped me for years is suddenly mm -hmm. crashing in on me. But But in particular, if they lack if this is new to them and me, we're both kind of struggling sure, to see sure. it, them to express it and me to understand what it is they're trying to express. So, so uh, Augustine's notion that, that humility is the key to education, uh, just, just a principle that, that I don't think this podcast is going to get over. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's so much there. That, that's kind of the cool thing, even in this conversation, right? A uh, year or two, five years from now, you and I could do another podcast or series of podcasts on Plato's allegories and we'd have entirely different material. The, right. the, the cool thing about the really useful, the really, the, 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 the bright light of the sun is that it's, it's, it's still blinding 50 years in, you know? Yep. Um, yep. so it's great, uh, great stuff, and I think uh, it can't be overemphasized. This is the kind of stuff that prepares one to to both go further up and further in in a classroom, and and to and to reflect the leisure. I know you and I want to do something on on uh, Joseph Pieper's leisure, the basis of culture. Um, far too many classrooms are in too much of a hurry, and Plato and his Ooh. analogies give us room to slow down and soak it all in. Um, there's a great deal of freedom for a teacher here. If, if they prepare themselves this way, the curriculum isn't quite so daunting. Yeah. I couldn't say it any better. Slow down, soak it in and behold truth. Well, thanks again for joining us in this great conversation about education. 
We hope you will not just listen, but participate. Leave us a comment, suggestion, or thought on our website. You just never know when we'll use it on the show. Until next time, pursue joy and learn something.